Hi, I'm Eric Christian, Vice President of Corporate Strategy and Business Development for Hubble. Today is our third, third episode in a new series that we call Candid Conversations, where over the last several weeks, we've been having, hopefully, candid conversations with leaders in our organization here at Hubble, as well as leaders in our industry. We've been discussing things about their career, what brought them to Hubble, trends in the marketplace, some personal experience as well. I, it's been a lot of fun so far. We've gotten great feedback, and hopefully those that are following are, are really enjoying it. Today's guest, I met well before I even joined Hubble. Uh, so I've known him uh, longer probably than I've known anybody we're going to interview, Neil Vandermeulen, who is Divisional Vice President of New Growth at Hubble Utility Solutions. Welcome, Neil. Good to see you. That's right. I forgot about that. We met uh, at the Tech show a long time ago. I was hunting for new acquisitions and found you on the on the floor <laughs> uh, selling toll grade. That's right. That's right. Very good. So, Neil, tell me about a little bit about your job, but also maybe about Hubble, how long you've been here, what brought you to Hubble, and some of the different roles you've had inside Hubble. Yeah. Right now, I'm a divisional vice president of New Growth, but I had to go to LinkedIn to kind of look at my past to remember everything <laughs> that I've done because I've been with Hubble for about 27 years. Isn't LinkedIn great for that, by the way? It keeps the record for us. Exactly. So uh, I've had a long run with Hubble. Uh, you know, looking back on it, I've moved five times with Hubble. I started off as electrical engineering, went to work for uh, AB Chance Company as an application engineer. The day I started, I was told that the company was for sale. And a year to the day later, it was purchased by Hubble. So that's when I became a Hubble employee. And at that point, the business was maybe uh, $200 million. So, you know, Hubble Power Systems was. Uh, so I just love to kind of be along for the ride here and help it grow to, you know, it was now about $2 billion. So from $200 million to $2 billion, it's been quite the ride. Gone from application engineer, I was in field sales, covering Iowa and Nebraska and Chicago for about three or four years. I was in product management with our hotline tools team. I was a marketing manager for our connectors group. I was an engineering manager, helped develop new processes. I was a vice president uh, GM for connectors, then for utilities. Then got involved with uh, acquisitions from 2014 to 2017. We did 10 plus acquisitions culminating in Eclara. So I was just blessed to be involved with that. Uh, and then also took on the developing of our communication sales team, run our pricing group. It's also a divisional vice president for our Centralia and Leeds business unit. So if I haven't confused yet, most recently I've dropped that divisional responsibility in order to start up a new division. Uh, it's called a Connected Initiative that we're hoping to grow to a billion dollar division over time. And uh, that and communication sales and pricing is taking up my time today. So for those that are listening who are inside the Hubble family, they're familiar with the Connected Initiative. It's something at Hubble that we're really excited about. We'll definitely talk about that in a, in a few minutes. But I was just curious, your journey, as you described it, many different roles. We were talking to Mark about this as well, a similar path. Maybe talk a little bit about being in an organization for a long period of time and the benefits that you get. All of these different opportunities to do different roles in different places. Yeah, the tremendous benefits. If we're recruiting, you want me on the recruiting trip because I will speak from the heart about how good Hubble can be if you put in the time and if you look to put points on the board and put in the effort uh, and all that. It's been a good run. I got my MBA later in life, you know, about 10 years ago at age 40. And all the people in the MBA school, they've all jumped from job to job to job to job, which is very common today. And they're like, dude, what are you doing? You could work here. You could work there. I really did some comparison contrast. And I really found that if you have a company that will support you and give you growth opportunities, you can really develop even stronger by sticking with that company because you grow a list of contacts and you get a knowledge that is deeper than you would get if you just jump from place to place while getting all the different opportunities. So if you're lucky enough, and you have to be lucky enough to be in a company like that, but if you're lucky enough to be in a company like that, it's a great opportunity. So I'd say if anybody's ever on the bubble uh, with our company, stick with it. It's a good company and it, and it pays off. So being in one company, paying off for you, for sure, new role, new growth initiatives, the connected initiative. But before we get there, HPS and now HUS, Hubble Power Systems, now part of Hubble Utility Solutions, known for being in the electric space. And we've been in the electric space for many, many years, electric utilities. But over the last, I don't know, what is it, Neil, 10 years or so, maybe even less, you've really led a charge inside HPS 
to get into other areas of utility, namely communications. And would love to get your thoughts on how that's gone and maybe the thought process of getting into communications. So in 2016, 2017, we as a company said, you know what, this telecommunication space like AT&T, Verizon, all that, this could be a good space for us. There's a lot of investment there, fiber to the home. There's a lot of common products, you know, all the stuff that goes on utility pole at the top of the pole, a lot of it goes at the bottom of the pole where the communications runs as well, too. So we said there's an opportunity here. So what we looked to do was run the Hubble Power Systems playbook for the communications side of the business, much like we did the power system side of the business. And it was possible because we share some common products. We have some common channel partners, gray bars, Wesco's, things like that. But what we were lacking, though, was a dedicated sales team. That was different. So we were doing about $60 million worth of sales back then and uh, said we really needed to ramp this thing up. So in order to ramp it up, what we did was we assessed the sales team and realized that we had a great group of agents, 10 agents, but that wasn't going to get us from here to there. We really wanted dedicated people that reported into us that didn't have line card conflicts and we can get their whole heart and head. So we changed out that sales force in 2017 from an agent network to a dedicated sales network, which is very tricky. But we pulled it off and pulled it off well. We had thought that we might lose some share in the transition. That might be uh, something to expect. But the next year, we're up 10% and we're continuing to grow and our sales are about double. So that's worked out really well. And I can't be more proud of the communication sales team. We have about 18 people on the team overall. You use the word risk, you know, and certainly a risk to make that switch, uh, one that's paid off quite nicely. Your background, NPD, new product development, some engineering background as well, plus M&A. You're sort of known, you have a bit of a reputation for taking risk. Maybe just talk to us about how you think about risk and how, in your experience, that's either paid off or hasn't paid off. Yeah, you know, and I've heard that before, Neil, you take risks, always kind of bristle at that a little bit. Because if you know me, I'm not a daredevil. I'm not out there just rolling dice and letting her fly or putting it all on red or or whatever the case might be. But I do have a passion for progress. I want to make an impact and put points on the board and see the needle move. So I really kind of look at it as progress. And there's some executional risk that comes with the territory, but it's just that. I just saw a documentary, 14 Minutes from Earth, on Netflix. It's actually not incredibly exciting, but you'd think it would be because it's about a guy, an executive from uh, Google, that decides that he's going to get the skydive record for 135,000 feet. Oh, wow. So, you know, plumbing at 800 miles per hour, it takes 14 minutes to drop from 135,000 feet to get to the bottom. Wow. And you think the guy would be a daredevil, but he's a computer science engineer, 57-year-old dude. When talking about the risk, he was saying, you know, it's, it's really not about the risk. If you look at all, everything that we're doing here, we've engineered a lot of that risk out of it. And the reason it looks risky is because you're doing something that maybe looks radically different or it's getting a different result and it's outside the norm. But in reality, we manage the structure risk. So we manage uh, all that. We did that with the communication sales move, which was, you know, on the surface risky, but we put a lot of uh, mitigation in place. And that's what we do with all of our moves. We put as much mitigation in place so that it's not daredevil risk. It's risk of execution on variables that you know that are always there. You have to be paranoid about, but you look to manage them. Talking about risk, I joined Hubble, as our listeners know, because we talked about it with Alan Conley in the first session. He and I both joined Hubble through the Eclair acquisition. And Eclair brings a certain set of skills, a certain set of products, really complementary to what HPS was doing at the time and and still does. Uh, HPS, uh, an absolute market leader in utility components. And you and a team have identified really an incredibly exciting space that's sort of in between and fits overlaps over both called the Connected Initiative, which you mentioned earlier that you're leading now. Maybe just talk us through starting something from scratch, you know, having having your hand in the mud and being able to mold exactly the way that you want things to be and your excitement for this initiative. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, a ton of excitement for the initiative. And I'll just kind of explain it really quick and as I get into the excitement. But Eclara, if you look at the Eclara offering, our electric meters and just as important, the communication structure to communicate to the electric meters. If you look at the Eclair products, you could say those are the products that help make the grid communicate. And then if you look at the HPS products, you might say insulators and hardware and connectors. Those are the things that give the grid structure. And we realize that in the middle, there's a whole nother set of products that we actually value at a market of six to eight billion dollars 
that is grid control, things that make the grid act or react, things that possibly can sense, that can have a little bit of intelligence and communicate in order to uh, optimize the grid, give protection, and make everything work better, actually truly create the smart grid. That's what we're looking to set up. And that is incredibly exciting just in itself because it's in the middle of the Hubble utility solution space. It can be very connective tissue to both sides of it, so that's neat. Uh, there's a lot of new product development and acquisition that will come along with it. But also, from a societal perspective or an industry perspective, you're helping to build the smart grid. You're helping the electric utility and making their own utility Internet of Things come alive and come together. And, you know, in the world of the coming uh, utility Internet of Things, Hubble has a lot of things that the utilities have to put up on the lines anyway. Arresters, insulators, connectors, what have you. So if you can take what's increasingly cheaper electrical components uh, and put the sensing and the communications and the thought into the form factor of the products that have to go up on the lines anyway, it's very exciting to think about what those products can do and then what the whole system can do. So it's very exciting that it could be leading us into a direction where we're not only making the things, but now you're involved with the systems and with the rich data flows. And that could open up a whole world of platforms that we haven't even imagined yet in terms of the products that we could offer. So it's very exciting. It's very neat. So, Neil, as we're talking about connected initiative and you're laying out part of your vision, we've talked in earlier candid conversations with some of your colleagues about key themes in the industry, key trends in the industry. Maybe touch a little bit about those key trends and how that plays into your vision for connected initiative. Yeah, the timing could not be better for Connected Initiative from a electric utility mega trend perspective. Those of us in the industry here know that it's very well documented that the, the utility infrastructure is old and getting older and getting creakier, especially in places like California, that can become devastating when things get too old and out of maintenance. And it calls for much better control over the system to know what's going on in order to prevent a fire or an accident or something like that. So there is a trend there. Probably the bigger trend, though, is renewables and EVs and energy sources that are not the typical energy sources. When the Pearl Street Station went in under Edison or for the first you know, 100 years for electric utility, electricity always flowed centrally on out. And now you're getting bi-directional power flows. You've got, uh, you've got a wind farm that's sometimes on and sometimes off. You've got a solar that's sometimes on, sometimes off. You have an EV that sometimes pulling power off the grid or sometimes pushing power back on because it's getting sold back on. So it's getting incredibly complex to run the grid and protect the grid from overcurrents, overflows, overvoltages, undervoltages, unsafe conditions. And there's where you really need this element of control. You need more connected switches. You need more connected edge computing and controls to reflexively react at the edge on the fly when there's a problem, but also communicate to the head end to make sure that it's all acting in sync at the same time. And you get to the point where everything out there can become a sensor. These meters that were just for revenue measurement now become a sophisticated sensor at the very edge that can help feed into one connected initiative to kind of bring it all together. And as you're describing it, you can really hear how Aclara and HPS kind of merge into this one thing, this one connected initiative, this smart grid, Internet of Things of the future. It's really exciting. It is. So as you're thinking about rolling this out, it's early days, but maybe fast forward 12 months, 24 months, three, four years. What does success look like ultimately in the next uh, you know, year, two, three years from now? How are you thinking about success? Well, I mean, uh, we're a business, so we're thinking about success in terms of, <laughs> of revenue targets. And I'm not... Uh, I'm, Our shareholders appreciate that answer. That's uh, good. Uh, and so do my <laughs> bosses. And, and so do I. I mean, that's one way you measure uh, the way things um, progress. But hopefully, though, what you also see, though, is you know a semblance of a division around certain types of products, you know, these, these smart protective products. You know, we, we'll have done an acquisition or two. We'll have new products developed or underway to be getting into a billion and a half, $2 billion worth of new business. So we'll be progressing along those lines. And hopefully we'll have set up a bit of a, a, a more collaborative engineering development ecosystem where instead of developing all of our products purely as business units trying to make their own P&Ls, 
we've come up with some cross products where the products are actually better together, where, you know, you can buy an arrestor or you can buy this edge computer and they're both going to be competitive in the marketplace. But because we've cross collaborated, if the customer buys both of them from us, then they're going to get a little bit of extra value and it's better together. Kind of like akin to the Apple ecosystem, right? I mean, you would buy uh, Apple AirPods or a watch or a phone based on their own merits, but nobody can contest that actually if you get the whole ecosystem, it even works better together. Hopefully we're striving toward that, that we're all working more collectively together. So you mentioned at the top of our podcast here that You've moved quite a bit for Hubble over the years. And I know Alabama is somewhere uh, that you lived and you liked living. And I know that brought you to it being an Alabama football fan. Roll Tide. Your daughter goes to Clemson. Right. That's got to create tremendous conflict in the house. How does that work? I'm all for Clemson until they meet in the <laughs> championship game. And then it's a... Uh, then it's Alabama all the then way. Then it's Alabama all the way up until about the second quarter when it's clear that Clemson's going to win, and then I'm a Clemson fan all over again. So, Your daughter, I know you and I have talked, being in a college campus right now, we're sitting here, it's end of August, early September time. Kids are going back to school, but this is a very unusual year for that in COVID. Yeah. So maybe talk a little bit about how it's affecting your day-to-day with you and your family, how you see it affecting the business, and just would love your thoughts in general. It's, it's top of everyone's mind. Yeah, I mean, I don't think I have anything um, enlightening to share with anybody uh, else in the United States because we're all living it at the same time. But uh, yeah, my daughter is now back at college. They're actually online, but my sons that go to high school here in Columbia, South Carolina, they are doing full contact school. It kind of makes you uh, think a little bit, you know, because the uh, COVID is still all fresh in our minds. I don't want to get it. But at the same point, I do start to see us return to normalcy. I'm in the office now as we record this. Fingers crossed that over the next four to six months, we're all getting close to normalness again. So it's affected the family like everybody else, fears, changes in how we do what we do. But work-wise, you know, beyond the obvious, I have this communication sales force. And it's been interesting because there's never been more demand for broadband and for Internet. I know at my home because my computer is always crashing as a result. <laughs> but um, a lot of these uh, communications utilities have found that they actually have more access during construction season to places they normally wouldn't, you know, uh, that down the uh, thoroughfares or down streets or in public areas, they could actually get in. So the business uh, has actually been strong and the challenge has been getting the product out the door and servicing it, which is a good high level problem to have. Very good problem to have. Well, that's great, Neil. Thank you so much for being our third guest in our podcast series, Candid Conversations. I've really enjoyed spending more time with you and I know our audience will too and learning a little bit about the Connected Initiative, but more importantly, learning about you. So just thanks so much for your time today. Thanks, Eric. 